Welcome to industry talk, everyone. <laughs> Isn't that the coolest? That is crazy. <laughs> it's my little David Bowie stylophone it. that he used <laughs> on uh, Space Oddity. Okay, yeah. now, okay, yeah. I was like, where does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> That's that cool. I'm still learning how to use it, but it's fun. <laughs> I got a VHS of that. I got to find it somewhere. It's a great album. Yeah. We <laughs> have VHS of what? Oh, I'm confusing it with um, Space Odyssey. Space, yeah, oh, Space Odyssey. Yeah, Space, Space Odyssey. 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 Sorry. Oh. But I have heard a of Space some. Odyssey. It's funny you say that because I said Space Odyssey last time Matt corrected me. And so. Okay. Great minds think okay. alike. Great minds think alike. Because <laughs> I have heard a familiar sound on there, but wow, that's pretty cool. How much is, did you have? The... Yeah, I bought that. They went about forty bucks. Oh, okay. Forty to one hundred and twenty, depending on like. So that's like a basic one. You know, yeah, it's like the original one that came out in the seventies, and uh, I think it was the first one with a vibrato, and that was David Bowie's input. I think uh, it comes with the whole booklet there where I read stuff and. So yeah. is it just like an oscillator, like a, a square oscillator or something like that? I believe so. Yeah, it's just a, some kind of synthesizer. You have a metal plate here and a metal pen. Yeah. And the contact makes a noise. So it's nice. some version of a theremin almost, I think. Nice. Yeah, someone asked me if it was like a theremin. I was like, no, because the theremin's like... Hand in movement. Yeah. This is actual Which metal I, on metal yeah, contact. But yeah, it has that same kind of thing. It does have like here where you can switch it from different tones so i'm on mid-tone you can go higher or lower. oh so going up so can, and... yeah and then there's a volume knob but yeah that's crazy it's so many like weird simps out in the world that's just like collectibles that's, that's a throwback yeah. yeah oh yeah. yeah yeah that's a limited edition one that came out with or something it probably so in the excitement several million so limited my ass but <laughs> in the excitement of our 70s electronic instruments we Sailed right past introductions, so I want to welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> That's how into it I was. Because me working in studios, like I know guys who just collect synths just <clears throat> for the hell of it, and it's just just a weird museum piece. Yeah. In, <laughs> so uh, back uh, the summer between my junior and senior year of high school, I got to go to uh, Wait, we, all my good? college. So we're gonna sail back past intros again. No, I, I introduced Fred. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, there's Fred. He's a sound guy. That's yeah. why the intru- <laughs> instrument thing We're, we're going to get back to that. We're going to get back <laughs> okay, to that. So I, wanna, I just want to, he, he had well, another I, story. I felt <laughs> sidelined by the let's do introductions and then straight into a Brad story. So I just want to make sure the listeners don't feel cheated either. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I just kind of felt out of the conversation y'all just had. So I guess that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking synthesizer. Okay, so between junior and senior year of high school? Or? Yeah, honestly, none of that really matters. I was about a high school. I'm gonna I'm gonna truncate the story story for you. Um, I had spent an extra couple weeks and uh, at a college during summer break. And at the college, I was doing like that was my course study was music production. Mm-hmm. And they had um, not that but a moog. Yeah. And then they had the moog, a, I don't yeah. know specifically the what moog the instrument too. is, but it's this thing. It looked like it belonged at like a telephone operator yeah. desk. And mm-hmm. when the guy was playing, oh, the professor yeah. was playing with yep. it, it's, That's right, that it was Steely Pink, Dan Pink Floyd shit. shit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was just, it was and, fucking cool. And it's just, it's crazy dealing with those kind of uh, synths because you have to do... A plug board. Yeah, you have to do recall. So if you mess up one thing after a different session, you got to... You, nowadays, you can just take pictures of it and know the exact setup, but... It was all memory. Yeah, yeah. you have to recall each session and... Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tie in, or at least I'm gonna attempt to tie in shit. what you were just saying to why it's relevant to us hanging out a little bit, actually. Yeah. So, uh, Fred, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do in the movie industry or have done. Um, specifically, let's. Uh, 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 I'm gonna let you do it. No specifics. Yeah. You do it. So I'm I'm uh, actually I'm getting over this anxiety of telling me about telling myself about people. Uh, because I have a long history of just learning things. Mm-hmm. And I, I tell people all the time, like, I lived my 20s for like 20 years because I always had a big interest. So in relation to film, I primarily do sound mixing and post audio. Uh, I've been doing sound for 
it's about to be it's 17 years now so um anything from production to engineering uh and then i made my way into film production uh audio post audio uh and at that same time i've also be, uh, became an editor so i was an editor for about 17 years as well uh studied everything from music videos docs narratives shorts the whole nine every technique um i am a writer I've only been a writer since 2015. My wife taught me how to write, which was, you know, bless her heart, because um, I, I really, really didn't know that I could do that sort of thing until I was prompted to make a story. I was like, oh shit, maybe I can do writing. And now I'm really focusing on directing more. That's what I'm. That's my my go-to right now is directing. So you guys. You and your wife are really a powerhouse couple, and just yeah. <laughs> just uplifting people, just an inspiration yeah. to be around. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Janae is the the other half. She's the more organized half, where I'm just uh, I could be chaotic, creative, uh, come out of nowhere with big picture ideas, and she reels me back down with a balloon string, telling me like, <laughs> "Yo, Earth is right here." Um, and she puts, she keeps me grounded in terms yeah. of like when my ideas get out of control. Um, and she is a brilliant writer. She can break down any, review any story. Mm -hmm. and, and she can keep that continuity for so long. Like y you, you'll be surprised how much she can remember about a story structure and be like, no, well, he didn't do that in this last scene. His shoe was untied. Mm -hmm. and I'm just she's like, she's always on point whenever she scripts supervisor. Like, well, she was, and I yep. know she has it written down, but she ain't looking at her notes. No, no. <laughs> she's calling that off top. And the sad thing is she doesn't do scripty anymore. She's no, not, I know. It breaks my heart. Yeah. It breaks my heart. Because it was a production that we worked on together last year that had no scripty, and it was like, eating inside of her because what you were just saying she would bring it out like it, it was instinctual she does for it yeah, naturally yeah yep. and you know it wasn't her responsibility but she couldn't separate herself from it so yeah because no one else was there doing it it was just the scratch that yeah wouldn't yeah. go away and it and, it, it's, it, and it, it sucks that she stopped because i mean she was right like scripty is oftentimes one of those jobs that's consolidated in another position because like, it's underappreciated the yeah. value the value of what's there people really just the the last few sets that i've been on where i i asked i was like you know can we have a scripty they tell me oh you've got one and then i find out on set that like literally it's their first day ever on set yes. and i have to describe the job to them well i can't describe scripty to you like i can tell you what the basics is yep. but if Follow i'm if along, i'm make sure they say the things but but continuity if, but if i'm having yep. to explain it to you on the day then that means you don't have the skill yep. to actually hit those checkpoints that i need you to hit yep you know you you are you need to be reliable yeah like and it is an important job and i think overall it's completely undervalued and it, it saves you financially because oftentimes they think they're saving money by not hiring scripties but they're actually calling everyone for reshoots yeah tell me how much saving that's saving you, you. from oh, prevent you're wearing the wrong sweater yeah. or you didn't have your hat on or something it's wearing a piece of jewelry measure. too early for a whole day and then finding out oh shit that's not supposed to happen until this scene yep. someone needed to see that and that's your script yep because they know either. that script inside and out thank you for done snapping their own. farther away from the microphone yeah. <laughs> i really appreciate it my ears appreciate it because it's like are you going to pay 250 300 a day for a scripty or are you going to pay over a thousand something dollars plus repair crafty work. and locations and everything else. yeah post-production <laughs> repair because you forgot that continuity now you gotta uh do rotoscoping on vfx if you <laughs> can not everything can and be solved leftover oranges is yeah. not crafty <laughs> and the leftover oranges is not crafty <laughs> so yeah 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 she's she's done um it was more of like a sombering moment of being done not like a frustration or anything but mm -hmm. Uh, nonetheless, that's one less scripty in Michigan, and it sucks. It does, um, yes. And I, I, I share the sentiment in my my positions because it, there's there ha there has been points where, you know, I'm doing productions and I'm just like, I don't know why I'm here right now because I'm really tired mm -hmm. or doing these long crazy hours mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and you know, it really does test you. 
when you're doing positions like that. Yeah. Um, when, when oftentimes is you really just need to take a break instead of yeah like really questioning if that if you're in the right industry or not yeah there is like being on set it's a whole it's a whole other monster right so like like in the past like three years i've done several like probably 10 or more productions like features Mm -hmm. not not to mention commercials and music videos because those are a day or two Mm -hmm. usually a year and that's like it's crazy yeah yeah, that's a lot. It's almost unfathomable if you're doing proper pre-production with. I mean, as G and E, there's not as much that goes into the pre-production stuff. But you know, we definitely want to have a good tech scout day. Yes. And I, I mean, I want to be talking with the DP for at least a week or two. Yeah. About equipment. There should be a table discussion. Literally. Yeah. Every like, time. And, and like, honestly, like, I. Unless the DP is just going to come to me with a plan, I would like to be there for more of the discussion as a gaffer to, like, have a say. Uh, not necessarily a say, but to, well, if that's what you're going to do, this is what I would do. Right. Like So, like, they're not hung up on something that could be diminished by me just having an opinion right. at the table. Right. Or figuring it out when you get there, which always... Well, so like a script, a script scene could read, uh, let's take uh, a simple exterior, right? And it's supposed to be nighttime and uh, outside of a store. Without talking to the DP, you may not know that you need to simulate an empty parking lot's worth of lights. You know, in your mind, you could have only been getting one spotlight down from the top to to simulate one street light and then light the scene and he was like no i was thinking because i wanted to be able to frame it so that i could see the car all the way in the moment you can't rectify that if you're not prepared if there wasn't a discussion beforehand and so now you're down to arsenal of lights yes different arsenal of supplies like now you're going like say we're talking a small budget and like oh all we can do is like a one ton grip package well that request you just uh, exampled for us was, I'm going to need like a five ton grip package. Right. Like you're not even taking up one step higher. You're taking it four steps higher. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like just the amount of stands and and scrims and like mm-hmm. nets or silks, any kind of all you name shaping. it. Yeah, there's all the shaping and the sources. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So that's just the grip packages. That's all the diffusion and what like we rig the lights on then you also need to have the actual light fixtures themselves the power to run the lights mm-hmm. the power to run the lights yes like so many generators and the cord to get to them or you know house power which is so unlikely depending on what kind of lights you're running but mm-hmm. if you want them old-fashioned tungstens house power ain't gonna oh, cut no. it until, especially no. not for a whole <laughs> giant parking lot you know what i mean yeah so, no. You want that car 200 feet away, you're going to have to cheat it. It's it's really surprising to me how often pre-production is not done. You know, like, no. as an AD, very, very rarely have I been able to get compensated for prep days. And while mm-hmm. on the one hand I'd like to be, on the other hand, I just want some actual prep done because it's going to make the days on set a lot easier. So mm-hmm. I would sacrifice that if everybody in play would come in and and have these discussions and we talk about these scenes not five minutes from wrapping this scene going into the next one saying okay so what's the plan for this one and i'm like whoa hold on because i asked you these questions discussion now yeah and all of a sudden new ideas are coming and i was thinking this and it's like no we we were supposed to have thought that already right you know there should be a plan of action already going into this so that we can just relate to each department on how we want to hit this look yeah you know like if we were planning on shooting that said scene and in my mind when i read it and i knew that we didn't have access to a five ton grip my mind would have put the 180 line with the parking lot behind us and the playing field the stage with the wall of said building right there so now we only have to light the the cast in that building and then we can get ambiance coming from backlight right Mm -hmm. but if the dp and the director are like no that's too closed in we need to swing around and see it and we don't have the necessary resources to do that 
and we're trying to go forward ahead anyways now you've got people arguing no that's not going to look right blah 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 fast forward 45 50 minutes and not a frame has been shot Mm -hmm. what has been saved yeah absolutely not yeah and i uh i think from that perspective become a time eater yeah 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 and that perspective with pre-pro like oftentimes when i think about pre-production i think of just paper lots of paperwork yeah lots of just manual stuff and i wonder if the scenario that i create in my head when i think about a production that has bad pre-pro is a producer or somebody in that pre-production phase is dealing with four projects at a time so they try to find a way to omit having to do paperwork or all of the pre-production and just have a regular conversation with you and say, hey, how can we do these light setups? And you talk about it over the phone, you'd be like, okay, good. But in the midst of it, you didn't talk about that with your DP. You didn't talk about that right. with sound. You didn't talk about that with anybody else. So there's a disconnection in communication because now when you get on set, the gaffer didn't know you had that conversation. The DP didn't know you had that conversation. Now it's the figuring it out part. It's a domino mm-hmm. effect because, so the gaffer didn't know. So now he knows and he gets it going. Mm-hmm. And sound was off loving talent and they get in and for whatever reason, black light shoot gets thrown out the window. So even the actors don't know what they're supposed to be doing. We get camera up because we're running out of time and we start shooting and all of a sudden there's boom shadow everywhere because the lights that the gaffer had put up because he was told to light 360 is now causing a triple boom shadow from one boom casting it across so it's like this is why we shoot one camera at a time one camera one angle yeah. at a time <laughs> because there are too many components to yep. allow for that many heads on the snake yeah like if each camera is the head Multi cam is a beast. Cut man. off all but one. <laughs> it's, I've never had I mean, a successful multi cam. Yeah. Sure. I've had several successful scenes with it, but it was nightmarish. Like the amount of time to correct the slightest little things yeah. for camera two, right? That are still borderline now upsetting the ultimate a shot. Like yeah. To to clarify yeah. my statement. Anytime I've worked with second cam rolling, it was not prepped that way. So Never. second cam was just introduced. So yeah. I can't say I've had an unsuccessful planned two camera shoot mm-hmm. because I haven't had a planned two camera shoot. I've had, hey, we've got a second operator. Oh, yeah. He's putting it here. No, it's so. never been planned. It's just that I'm not. It's gonna just willy allow... nilly. Hey, we got a second camera. This should save us some time. Yeah, but, no. then, it but then no. now we got to sign off on the angle still. You mm-hmm. know and. Yep. One guy's like, I don't like this square light on the wall. And I'm like, well, it looks great in this one, and it's supposed <laughs> to be a window. You got here half an hour late, and you missed that conversation. Yeah. Right. Like, and then nobody comes to my defense as a gaffer. They're like, well, how can you fix it? And I'm yeah. like, what do you mean? Fix? Like, we're ready to go over here, shoot the shit, and move over here, and then we'll mm-hmm. fix it. Because if I do what he needs, your shot's fucked. And that's the reason why I'm big on the the whole paperwork idea of jotting stuff down, putting planning as much as you can in pre-pro because now you can just send that off to a mass email and yes, get everybody and on the to same. everybody. Yeah, because the figuring out is what takes the time, especially mm-hmm. between takes. And there are variables. So, but working in independent film, like you may not know exactly what your location is going to be like mm-hmm. the weeks ahead of time. Now we'll get to it but you should do your location scouts mm-hmm. and and then modify so take the email that was sent out with you to the location scout and then say okay well this is what we have planned and then this yes. and so forth mm-hmm. but so i i want to i want to say that i do realize at this level of independent film that there are some variables that ultimately could fuck your your pre-planning but yeah i was listening to ron howard's master class recently and ron howard is oh, arguably dude, he's ridiculous one of the, the more man. prepared yeah. one of the more man. prepared people out there and he even makes a statement that you know because pre-planning 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 he's talking about it and he says but regardless of how much time you put into prep that doesn't mean that when you get on set the you're chaos not gonna... of the day yeah the right product. but that's but why you're you plan prepared every different fucking yes. thing. exactly Right. Yep. So you can make an audible. You can make a, a an informed because decision it's based educated. upon. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. So you're already yeah. prepared for it. Question for y'all: How do y'all? How often do y'all get to do pre visits or pre lighting 
for locations. Only for my own, own productions. Stuff. Or if I get, like, um, I had, a, I had a, a little bit of time to do that for, like, uh, when we did, like, I did a Marshall ad for guitar, right? Like, I wasn't gaffer, mm -hmm. but the gaffer had time to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I was aware of that as a grip. You know what I mean? Um, the sh the Chevy thing where I, I gaffed, the DP and I talked over the phone, emailed back and forth. I you know he knew what we had. He knew I knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel too challenged. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like in the moment, it yeah. was it was a challenge being the gaffer with just one grip putting up. 420 buys to block out the sun and create a mobile tent Jeez. in five minutes because why aren't you doing this faster? And I was like, well, I got one guy. You guys, <laughs> nobody's helping and you want me to hook up dollies too. Like, there's different challenges, right? Like, as a gaffer, I had no challenges, but I was also key gripping this thing. So, wow. you know, it was a challenge in a different way. I have yet to receive... A previs of any kind no storyboard really um as far as shot lists what people define as shot lists is is not a shot list i don't Very get loose, yeah i don't get medium shot of this person you know panning this person i get um we need to capture that and then capture this <laughs> and then and then when i ask like how many shots and like oh 16 i'm like oh, 16 i've seen shots. storyboard <laughs> but, maybe twice in but my life if you told me 16 and i could <laughs> itemize it down then i could put it into a shooting order that could allow us to get in and out of right. the scene but that's not they it's it's all chaotic it's right it's, i mean i don't want to bring up any specifics for obvious reasons but it's very generic yeah the the descriptions that i get and i, and I look at it and they're like I'll say like, well, how come I haven't gotten a shot list? Oh, you got a shot list, and the, that thing I sent you. And I look, and I was like, well, that, like that's that's <laughs> a description of things happening. A word that's document. not <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing as far as framing, nothing as far as what we want to see and what's featured. Uh, oh, excuse me. It's all planned on the day. Yeah. It's all. I need to see the blocking. Yeah. Okay, like I get that, but. There's no way, there's no way Roger Deakins shows up on set and says, well, I got to see the blocking first. Right. He got the script. He knows what the context of the story is. He has seen his set. He's had his discussion with his directors. He's had his discussion with his gaffers, so he knows where the light is. He knows the emotion he's trying to get. So he knows, shit, I got six hours. I really want to do these long takes, so we're going to do five shots. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the 12 that I had. These are the ones that I want to get. Yeah, exactly. What about lighting diagrams? Do y'all ever get those? No. I mean, I I do them, but I'm rarely asked for them. Yeah. Um, like I said, on the bigger. You're never stuff, really given prep time for the set. To I'm develop not. One. No, but there are projects that like okay, so uh, the city and color videos, mm -hmm. uh, gaffed by Dave St. George, uh, and with Spencer Hato and Fred Gomez, we. I wasn't there for any of that, but they did that. I showed up, he mm. showed it to me, and I was like, oh, yeah, totally. Don't. Yeah. Nice. And we just attack. I didn't have to go, hey, Dave, what were you thinking about? He just showed me, and he just, he was like, this is this, this is, and he explained everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know my because trade. Because it was fourth so we just, it. Yes. We just went in, boom, and I did, you know, guns akimbo, dicks akimbo is like what I like to say, but... We knew we didn't have to ask. If if I was asking for it, I was like, "Hey, I need help because I'm stuck up here. I'm I'm a clamp short. You want to throw me something or right. you want, yeah, down below, dropping cable, catch this." What's really you know, beneficial like, to that is, let's just say, worst case scenario, you get done with that. They fire the camera up and they don't like the way it looks. All the time that wasn't wasted with the planning on the day of the set, you now have to make tweaks to make it oh yeah closer to what you want. So like we we'd spend. 60 to 90 minutes doing the initial setup just attack 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 go 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 see what's you know check all the corners now check it in frame mm -hmm. right oh okay now we tweak yeah for yeah sometimes five minutes sometimes 45 minutes mm -hmm. but we have the time for that yeah you know what I mean? oh let's move that one two foot this way for camera for this and you know what i mean it's yeah. And it's just so beautiful, and it's it's a it's like it's a dance in this you know this brotherhood. You can definitely see yeah. the work reflected. The the videos are fucking gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah, we did 
uh, three videos in three days, really two and a half, because it was around Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving time. Nice. Canadians already had their Thanksgiving, so yeah. they really were just like, oh, you guys either do your Thanksgiving or don't. No, so they just did a skeleton crew for that day. But yeah, like and my I, buddy Fred Gomez, he shot on Thanksgiving for City of Color. And I find that lack of like diagrams or shot lists, like, that's more inconveniencing because... It's cool when you work with somebody and you know y'all have a chemistry, you, you got the shots in your head, but at the end of the day, like, it's always going to help when you can, like you said, just see it and you don't yes. have to spend that extra microseconds asking questions back and forth. You just Absolutely. look at it, go, and, uh, like, I wish more sets do that. It still it's... surprises me when we're on set and the DP stands back like a golfer talking to his caddy for a lens. He's like, mm, well, I think we'll do the, let's try the 50. Where, I mean, that should really... Pull out your measuring tape. <laughs> I never thought about that in golf. It should be... That you was kn- funny, dude. That you was knew, good. You know going into the scene how you want the look to be. You should know going in, I'm going to shoot this with these lenses. Yeah. I don't want it shouldn't be a guess in the moment. <laughs> You know, give me uh, a picture. Yeah. Come on, give me a picture and wedge on this one. Camera's leaning a little to the frame left. Let's go ahead and get the uh, 35 on the mouth end. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that's, that's how it is on the sound end because, like, I have multiple different microphones with different situations, but mm-hmm. I, I just automatically walk in a room and I'll be like, no, I'm going to need the medium uh, yeah. mic. Uh, I'm going to get the long one for this one. Um, you understand the acoustics of the space. Yeah, yeah. I just look at it and I'm like, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. But yeah, I, I do. That's how I am with lights. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, do want to know, okay, what angle are you shooting from? What's our motivation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I still basically know these are the three or four things I really am gonna need. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And let's see what he has to say for the variations of those four things. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, how valuable are tech location scouts for sound? Half the battle. There's <laughs> a loaded question. You're I smiling knew the because you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's literally half the battle and it's never from, done. From what I've heard from uh, my my other fellow sound guy friends is mm-hmm. that, like, the biggest thing is, like, showing up to test for, like, wireless signal. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and that kind of, like... Yep. Especially the closer you are downtown Detroit, right? The, the hertz and stuff. What you can yeah. well, by the river, by the river, you're going to get cross from all of the different exactly. boats coming in, exactly. especially near the border of Canada because mm-hmm. the, the coast guard's going around the with their radar canceller and they're just killing. I I did it oh, so long ago. I did a a thing at the nautical museum. I was running a, a soundboard mm-hmm. and I was just the board op. I didn't set up any of the stuff, and they had wireless mics, and it's right on the Detroit River across. Oh, and every man. time the Coast Guard went Ooh. by, we dropped wireless signal, <laughs> and the guy tried to not pay me for it. And I, he was oh, like, well, you Jesus. couldn't problem shoot it. And I, I, the, the second time it went out, I just grabbed the XLRs that I had. Just plugged them boys. Plugged them boys in, <laughs> ran them up to the stage, plugged them into a microphone, and he was like, no, they wanted wireless. And I'm like, bro, well, like, it's not if happen. you yeah. would have paid me to set this up, I would have told you it's impossible to do wireless. Yeah. It was, yeah. It's, it's, it's harder. This whole thing. It's harder and harder because a lot of the frequency blocks that we have, they're getting taken either by, you know, the FCC who's mm-hmm. making up all of these rules of what frequencies we can have yeah. or they're getting clogged up by other neighboring frequencies. And, um, yeah, it's a problem because now you can't think on terms of which frequency is free, but more so which antenna are you going to use that's – are you going to use a narrow antenna that only focuses on a line of sight or are you going to use an omni – which is going to just capture whatever's around it. Right. So now you're more so thinking of, I need more narrow antennas because there's just way too many interferences everywhere. Yeah. Um, so much technology everywhere. Yeah. Everything's wireless. Everything's broadcast through there. And, yeah, it affects our bodies, too, our, our own physical magnetic forces that we – our magnetic fields that we have, so – it's insane. Oh man, that I, I I remember I was seeing this article, and somebody made like a visual representation of 
every frequency that you could actually <laughs> see. With. It was ridiculous. It was just yeah. waves everywhere. And it's just like, Some this people is... are more sensitive to it. Yeah. <laughs> remember it really remember when the, the conversation yeah. used to be on how uh, your cell phone was just drawing cancer to like yeah, the, the antenna? Yeah. We just don't talk we about that anymore. Our, anymore. Our, our cell yeah. phones well, now have remember, how many more signals coming remember, into oh, and out of them? We used to like <laughs> preach about Save the Rainforest. Now they're just cut down. They're just gone now. We just our phones don't have antennas anymore, but they've got 12 other signals coming <laughs> in. <laughs> Bluetooth satellite. Yeah. So ultimately, you would say that um, location is scouting is ridiculous. super important. How often were you ever asked on a location scout? If I did 20 sets a year, probably one. It's, tech it's scout. crazy. Oh, I have been on wow. tech scouts. I have been on tech scouts where I still didn't know who my sound guy was going to be. Yeah. And it's always a surprise. What, what am I gonna? Yeah. What am I gonna do? And then we show up on set, and you find out the traffic is a problem. You're you next find to out the I've been hired as a gaffer and never not known who my DP was gonna be or yeah. if I had help. I I I do barely I have know Jenny? who the crew am is. I, I have to force myself to ask. And I ask them. the questions, but mm -hmm. it's the the round talk. That but it you comes yeah. down to it comes down to yeah. valuing the importance of being prepared. Yeah. You know, all of this it, it gets scattered. You know when all of these different details aren't assembled and you're minus two weeks from shooting yeah you know that's when you should start asking yourself am i ready yeah is it time for us to do this am i prepared because it's all going to cost extra money yeah yeah so i i definitely um for sure quinn you want to step in for a minute bro i definitely so, um peace out i have a little bit of anxiety when people call me like two weeks before a shoot and i'm very i'm much more hesitant in accepting projects two weeks before a shoot or if it's one of those situations where they rapidly need a sound person quickly mm -hmm. because that makes me think what happened to the last one yeah and i just get a little questionable and i start saying all right i, I asked a bunch of questions but oftentimes the biggest thing that gets overlooked when I talk to a producer is they never tell me who the crew is. Mm -hmm. And I have to ask them, like, who's on crew? Can you give me a name? Can you tell me what DP? And it's it's never like nothing that they just come up to you up front, like, okay, just letting you know the crew is going to be this DP's name, him, such and such. I often have to keep asking. Yeah. Because, you know, I want to know who I'm working with. Like, yeah. It's not. A hundred percent. I mean, that's, that's. A big part of the excitement sometimes is who you who you're going to be working with mm -hmm. because this is a collaborative art. At the end of the day, mm -hmm. we all have to work together, and regardless of what department you work in, it, it, there needs to be a cohesion. Yeah. Um, it's I, I I think a big misstep in a lot of the ways that producers are assembling their teams, their casts, is by undervaluing the individual responsibilities yeah. of each department and their subsequent you know uh crew members yeah um you know something as simple as crafty is so important oh my you God. know and to not have somebody at the craft table making sure that you know when the cooler is empty it's refilled and it's like this sounds petty but i'm using this as an example of even the the smallest minor thing has importance yeah exactly so if if I can make a, a, a long-winded conversation about crafty, what kind of long-winded conversation can I have about sound? Yeah, yeah, exactly. About lights. Yep. And and the other thing is, um, no, I don't, I don't believe that no crew should come individually. Everybody should come in pairs, mm -hmm. and that's been a big, uh, I wouldn't say fighting point, but there's been plenty of times where I had to really fight to get my sound utility i don't understand set. why they it, allow these sound you know it's just it, it's too much Francisco yep. would say the same thing yeah i i stopped doing sets that doesn't allow me to have sound utility i flat out one, deny the general. one needs to focus so. on first off the quality of the sound yeah the mixing the the whatever you have at hand because i know everyone operates a little bit differently but the boom operator should have that one sole responsibility of chasing out the conversation yeah. and and that is all yeah because it, it, it it's it's a responsibility as a sound mixer you're kind of a manager in your department so i have to step away from my bag or my cart to go talk to the director about the next shot 
Then I have to go into makeup to live talent, go back to my station, put the bag on, get ready for boom. And it's like, how do you expect me to do these multiple mm -hmm. positions before a take comes up? I joke <laughs> tongue in cheek a lot on set, waiting on sound. Yeah. But I, I do it because it's like, I, especially when I'm ADing, it's like, I know like you well, haven't been actually. given the yeah. time, <laughs> right? Like, come on yeah <laughs> you know who are we waiting on waiting on sound but it's like it's one of those things like i dare you to say fuck sound <laughs> i dare you <laughs> i'll be waiting on it too. please yeah. please say fuck sound Wait down lights fuck lights okay light walk i'll be like well is, i guess it's <laughs> mos <then. Yeah. laughs> fuck sound mos all right i heard turn, the man turn them off <laughs> uh before we wrap it up quinn did you have anything to add in about uh, our conversation this afternoon this evening in terms of pre-production yeah so I actually, two days ago for like an hour, I had, it was really my first, like, um, like the first time, like where I had like a serious phone call with a, with a director, Phil, Phil got me this, uh, he'll probably be a guest on you eventually. He got me the scripting job. And we're, we're working on it. He's trepidatious. Yeah. yeah um, shout out to Blackheart Forge. Yeah. He made me I a told knife. him he could promote, <laughs> promote and everything. He didn't. Um, yeah, we were on the phone with, I was on the phone with this director that was, he wants to shoot this in June. He wants to shoot this this like a four day uh, short up up north. And he was he, like, we just kind of talked it through where he was saying that he like doesn't want to bring Jenny's, but he, he wants to like, I was like, how are you gonna charge your camera batteries? You know, how are you gonna oh, run this? Wow. Like, how are you gonna run the, the he said he was thinking DIT about getting, getting, yeah, like three, three haze machines. And I was like, are you gonna find a haze machine that runs battery? <laughs> you know? You get one shot. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, and I was like, and I was like, are we hiking this into this nature trail for going up north to, to Munison? <laughs> And but he, this is he, what he I just, mean. He just hadn't thought it through, and I was just, <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, so, so if, if, and he was trying to tell me he wants to, he wants to, like shoot and use the trees, as like, as almost like a silk or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, you, yeah, you're gonna need, Lord. you're gonna need like a, yeah. you're gonna need a twenty by, maybe, yeah. a, maybe a, a twenty <laughs> by forty. And then he was like, is there any way we could avoid? And I was like, you're gonna need like four mambos if we're gonna do like a just giant stunt scene under this, this like silk in the field. And he was like. Well, what if we like? He was like, I was trying to think of how we could like sneak around it, and then he was like, What if we like tied the um, the twenty by to like trees instead of like like hiking up stands? And I was like, Well, I mean, Possible. who's climbing the trees? That yeah. that could, Possible. but now now we're talking. <laughs> yeah, now we're talking. Who's gonna bring the ladder? You yeah. know. And, and, yeah. and then I was like, and I was like, and you are gonna need a Jenny, by the way. So then, like, like I don't know. It's it, we have. But see, a that's lot the thing. Of, it's a it's a good conversation. It's, yeah. It, that's good to have months ahead of time than the on the day of because we've had these exact conversations on the day of because it's not that his ideas were bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's our job as a crew to try and and bring a vision to this life is, is the as reality of yeah. exactly yeah. as much as we possibly can we want to bring someone's vision to life we we're yeah. not here to stomp on anyone's dreams but if you throw that kind of shit at us at 7 a.m on the day of shooting and we're 30 miles from fucking society we have a half a gallon of gas and no generator and all of a sudden you've got these whack-ass ideas what are our choices? Yeah. Now I got to poo-poo all your shit because yep. it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. Had you brought this up to me beforehand, we could have worked this stuff out and found a way like, to get to it. if I can't have you out in the middle of nowhere with the woods, in the woods, good thing Joe brought his extra pack of cigarettes. <laughs> now right. you owe me because <laughs> right. he smoked like a whole pack There's of cigarettes. Like Cigarettes are that's a big Same big contention for me. There's, Every time well, cigarettes show up on my breakdown list, I'm like, please buy some fucking cigarettes but there's your haze stop stop taking them from, from the g and &E crew <laughs> there's your haze right do there. not expect your g and &E crew to supply the yeah. prop department I with your you fucking cigarettes you'll get me back i've heard you every you time you fucking won't <laughs> i'm keeping track y'all zero i'm i yeah no Way debts paid I, I, no, I'm, well I'm, fred shameful <laughs> i want to thank you so much for hanging after with us and oh, doing yeah. this little chit chat yeah um i love this this was this was amazing i i think it's incredibly important that we have an open conversation about uh pre-production and really uh shed light on its its value it's it's absolutely important um pre-production I, I forgot who said it um I think I might be saying it backwards, but they say like pre-production is a privilege before you get into production. Mm -hmm. And if you can have a smooth pre-production, everything just flows. And, you know, 
we can't just keep winging it. No, right. Like going 90% into it. of the questions that come up would have been answered had you just done yeah. the pre-production. Right. Yeah. Just had like, the boring meetings. Like, yeah. You, you, like when I see that light schematic or I have it and I explain it, it it's a map. Yeah. It's right there. It's in a guidebook every mm-hmm. single time. So and once there. you have those plans laid, you can still have alterations. You can come up with a new idea, but because you've had a focused and concise conversation with a plan of action, you can apply that to your changes without yep. rewriting the whole book. Exactly. Because at least now you've come to terms with this is how we want it to look. This is the mood. Like none of that's changed. We just want to flip the world. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, based on what we've discussed, this is what I can do based upon what I have. Yep. Yep. So I guess I have a question for you guys. So, mm. like low budget or indie producers will be like low budget indie producers. So is it actually is pre production more the responsibility of the department leaders for them to fight for the pre-production they're going to get because the producers are just going to try to save a buck is it more so the like the department leaders to fight for the pre-production or is it just the would you say is that kind of like more the reality of the situation when the like the ideal situation would be the producers would just give us the pre-production we need but i think that's a very very good question um the answer to that i think really comes down to circumstance because as Fred was mentioning, sometimes when you're called, when you're brought in, even as an AD, my very first first assistant director job, I got a week before shooting. I didn't get any of the information necessary four days before shooting. So I was putting together, and like as soon as I got the information put in my in my lap, people were would basically. Imagine someone handing me a stack of folders digitally, but let's yeah. make it visual. They hand mm-hmm. me a stack of folders, and then as their fingers leave it, begin asking me questions. Yeah. And what are we doing about this? And I'm like, oh, yeah. I've got this. I just, I just got this shit. Yeah. Call I don't me, know. Yeah. Call me so, two weeks ago yeah. and ask me in a week. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. ultimately, it comes mm-hmm. down to, uh, to answer your question, producers need to stop being in a hurry to get it yeah. done. Um, you have the money, cool. Figure out the best way to use the money, and and that, in order to do that, would be put all your department heads in place ahead of time, mm-hmm. right? And have the conversations that we're talking about. So yes, if as a department head I was brought in and I knew there was time for it, I would ask for it. I have asked for it. You know, on this last shoot, it was something that I I asked about, and we had something like meetings, but it was brushed off in a certain way as if it was taken care of, right? I was assured these were already done outside of me and the answers that I was, Mm -hmm. the answers that I was given was what I presented on set because that was (laughs) presented to me as something that was already hashed out, Yeah. right? So I was, uh, and you know, I'll, I'll take responsibility for it. You know, why pass the blame? Uh, I, I took that information as gold and it, it was, worth less than that there was chocolate under the wrapper Mm -hmm. but the the, i think the core answer to your question is is time and and producers producers Mm -hmm. are too much in a hurry yeah would you would you agree with that yeah yeah because it kind of reminds me of like if you're going to say it like in your position say if you just got the job because of somebody had to drop off for some reason I think of it on the scale of, like, say, if you worked for Ford and this big executive dropped out or some sort of big manager dropped out, now you got to fill in, you wouldn't just instantly give them a stack of paperwork and tell them, figure it out. You would have a structure in place. You see how the cogs are moving. But in film, it's almost like people treat it like it's a different world on every set when we've had many many years to figure this out Mm -hmm. we know what we're supposed to do but we just don't act on it It makes perfect sense the formula is proven we just hope for that spark of dynamite yeah it's too easy to shortcut because you can accomplish something yep from the shortcuts like you can you can actually stumble and still walk away with a film and tell yourself that it's a good film and i think that's a great analogy where you were talking about with ford so Mm -hmm. let's take that example you were saying and let's say during that replacement of that said important person they were three weeks from releasing a new model but production hasn't been completely 
fit yet because of some details that that particular person needed to iron out. Mm -hmm. So now the new guy comes in, in a Ford situation, they would say, release is gonna be postponed about five weeks. Mm -hmm. And in reality- And we don't do that in film. We have, they just wanna keep rolling because they'll just go to someone else. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we want to keep working and we, and we want to prove our metal. But at the same time, ultimately, I guess it is up to us, you know, whether or not we want to. You know, but it's the challenge, right? Yeah, fuck it. Yeah. All right, I'll do it. Yeah. Well, you were going to say in reality. Oh, because I was going to say, like, in reality, when you do have to replace somebody, most of the time they're going to just wait and they're going to talk to their team to figure out um, what they actually need before they go out and find that right person but like you know on the film set i understand there's like continuity time money being pushed um i think that needs to be put more into place like carving out time because if we don't carve out time and get things right when we find a replacement then you're ultimately sacrificing the film yeah so it's like do you want to delay and get it right or do you want to keep it moving forward and get it incorrect because you're not giving people the proper time to prepare for this project. Um, which one is going to lose more money? Yeah. At the end of the day? I, w- I will it, say I have been lucky enough to work with a few filmmakers um, on a repeated basis who project after project have taken notes. And while each further project wasn't perfect it was better and and noticeably different from the one prior because they took notice of these things that they Mm -hmm. undervalued originally and noticed the value based upon discussions similar to this that i had with them or i brought in with department heads and said like this is what we could do differently next time so there there is and i think that's that's a big Mm -hmm. thing like we have to as a team or as as individuals like push forward because uh, you know i I think ultimately we are a community here in in michigan like it's a it's a very small amount there's a large i don't know everybody yeah they don't know all me but at the same time we cross paths enough that this is a small enough pond to where like if we all trip we all fall so if we all grow and become better and and learn from it like i i I genuinely think that we're in a in a, a an era where something positive can come from this yeah you know their moves are being made we just want to make sure we're making the the best quality yeah yep exactly and i i believe in us i believe that we can do it yep yep i agree all right well yep. thank you everybody for joining us joe you got anything else you want to add from uh with it? oh yeah he's gonna close this out i feel like playing super nintendo hey. <laughs> Dig Dug, baby. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk to you next Peace. time. Peace.